when she first thought of volunteering for the NAT way back in 2008, being trained as an entomologist, she was certain she would be enlisted to help out in the insect lab, pinning bugs. But the staff had other ideas. And now after having been on virtually every committee and position on the board of trustees, including a stint as the chair, she now happily participates on the speakers committee, enthusiastically chatting with everyone and anyone who will stop for a moment to listen about all things NAT. Allison, take it away. Well, first, let me just say thank you very much for inviting the NAT into your homes and into your lives. Um, I first knew about the NAT when I was a youngster at an elementary school that will remain unnamed in San Diego. And uh, I remember coming to the NAT for one of those field trips that we all used to go on. Um, and I remember being scared to death by the mountain lion, stuffed mountain lion behind the, the plexiglass, plexiglass screen. Um, but um, I grew up in San Diego. I hiked in the chaparral. I hiked in the lagunas. I camped in the lagunas. I hiked and camped in Baja. And um, I'm just very much a, a supporter of the museum. What these, what the staff does on the small budget they have, I think, is extraordinary. And I'm very, I am enthusiastic about sharing all things NAT. I call these the NAT chats, but. Um, when the scientists come out, the staff scientists come out, of course, it's at a, definitely a higher level of, of uh, research expertise. So I will uh, beg your forgiveness if some of the slides that you see um, are, not, uh, in, are not detailed, nor will I uh, uh, tell you what the genus and the species of the animals and the, and the various critters you see. But um, what I'd like to do is give you just a, a hint of the uh, of the what goes on behind the net, and I will share my screen uh, as soon as I am able to. Here we go, and give me uno momentito, por favor. Play you a little slideshow. Um, everyone can see it, I assume. Yes. Okay. Yes. Great. I, yes, I can see it. Thank you. So, I'd just like to give you a, a, a tad of history. The, the The museum, the official name of the of the museum is the San Diego Society of Natural History, which started way back in the eighteen hundreds. And literally, the conversation to start the society was precipitated by these two gentlemen, what we now call citizen scientists. Uh, one of them was a railroad surveyor. One of them was a lawyer but they both love to collect uh, bugs and plants. And uh, that literally was the beginning of the formation of a small coterie of, of people who are interested in, in San Diego natural history. And the first actual museum was at the Hotel Cecil. And in 1912, they opened up two rooms opened them up twice a week, only in the afternoon to showcase the things that the, the, the society members uh, collected. And then of course you flash forward to now and we have, let's see, how many feet is it? 150,000 square feet. It's open eight hours a day and it's open six days a week, 363 days a year, obviously pre-COVID. Um, there are eight departments, what we call the ologies, things like herpetology, paleontology, entomology, ornithology, etc. We also have uh, sponsored the Canyoneers, which take thousands of San Diegans and visitors on hikes and walks throughout the county. Again, anywhere from Troy Pine State Park to Anza Borrego and um, all places in between. We have the Whalers program. We have uh, educational programs, lectures, exhibits, the 3D theater. There's, there's, a, there's a lot going on actually within the, the museum, but also outside of the museum, and which I'd like to really focus in on now. When, when folks ask me, well, 
what is the NAT? I mean, it's just a museum, right? And I said, well, okay, yes, it's a museum. As all museums have collections, whether they be art or musical scores, uh, we definitely have collections. Um, I, like to view, I like to think of it as a visitor center. So you can walk into the museum and get a hint about the bioregion in which is our, our mission is our bioregion, educating about our bioregion, which is uh, obviously San Diego County, but also the Baja Peninsula. We, <clears throat> pardon me. So our a permanent exhibit, for example, is called Fossil Mysteries, and you can go back in time 70 million years. A more recent uh, opening was our uh, Coast to Cactus exhibit, which we call literally a snapshot of our bioregion in space because it is the coast, Torrey Pine State Park. It's the chaparral as you go through the canyon lands up into the lagunas in, and all the way down into Anza Borrego. All of those, those eco areas are uh, vignettes that we have in, in this particular um, um, <clears throat> space, uh, exhibit, sorry. So museum as a, as, a, as a house for collections, we have 7 million collections, sorry, specimens. And this is just an example. In ornithology, one aisle has a lot of drawers of, of, of species that have been collected over the years. Um, I'd like to focus a little bit in on why the collection matters. So, so yes, we have 7 million species. We might have 1.4 million marine invertebrate uh, specimens. We might have a million entomological specimens and, and, and botany and all that. But if you're wanting to understand where you live, in our museum, you can focus in on various parts. So yes, this is a pretty slide. It's the gems and minerals. And we have, uh, we have an exhibit about gems and, gems and minerals. And most people understand the gold rush. That happened. That was a thing. But if you, if you focus down on San Diego County, uh, tourmaline mines, for example, were a big thing. Uh, there still are, I believe, two or three operational uh, tourmaline mines in San Diego, San Diego County. And I just like this because what it shows, if you're interested in chemistry and what have you, um, it just shows what a rock looks like and then what a rock really can look like with a black light, for example. My, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a big supporter of a library. So this is the, uh, we have the Eleanor and Jerry Navarra Library and we have uh, research volumes that folks Come, uh, scientists come in and, and, and look, look through. Um, this one I just gave a shout out to, not just because it's old, it's from 1517, but I like it because remember in the day, back in the day when we actually read books and you used to do uh, notes in your margins and what, ha what have you. So this one is notes in the margins in Latin and somebody's talking about the plant and the uses of the plant. It's essentially the, an original uh, physician's desk reference. And we have one of those in our library. An another thing to consider about the collections, and it, I know a lot of folks get a little nervous about collecting and um, what does it do to our ecosystem, but without the collection and identifying what lives here, it's really difficult to understand how the ecosystem in your area works. And over time, what things have changed have they changed genetic from the genetic uh, genetic uh, level all the way to the uh, habitat level? And uh, uh, this one, okay, so this is where I, I have to qualify. Though I'm an entomologist by training, the Kino checker spots an endangered species. And um, we have a lot of, we have, like I said, 1 million uh, insects in our collection. So, Biologists come into the museum and utilize our collections in hopes of being able to identify endangered species, for example, the Kino checker spot. But which one is it and what does it look like? And, and you can see here the plethora of basically orange flying insects. And uh, the, the, the biologist who wants to be hired 
to go out in the field and monitor for, for example, uh, somebody wants to develop a piece of land, uh, rules and regs require a biologist, a paleontologist, some, uh, somebody with in, uh, expertise in indigenous um, anthropology to go out there and, and survey. So these drawers upon drawers upon drawers of collections help those folks out as well. This slide is the one that um, literally, well, it wasn't the slide that got me into it, but touring the ornithology department and seeing uh, uh, Phil Unit open up the drawer and show me uh, pelican eggs from pre-DDT usage and with uh, during the bioaccumulation phase and then afterwards, I just think is amazing. So yes, collections matter. You got to know what was happening before in order, in order to better understand what's happening now. And one thing that the museum did, uh, this is when I was um, on the board uh, a long time ago, they, they did a hundred year survey. So a hundred years ago, let's say, they call a uh, research scientist from the NAT collaborated with Berkeley scientists and did a survey of the San Jacinto mountain range. These two pictures are roughly in the same spot hundred years apart. The collection that surveys the monitoring that occurred uh, recently uh, was in the same locations as a as hundred years ago. And I think what is the salient point here is to understand that without the data points that these scientists provided a hundred years ago and those in which those which were taken and collected and analyzed rec more recently, again, it's really hard to overemphasize the importance of what's happening in our ecosystem. And some of these data points are super relevant and important to proving that there's something called climate change that is occurring. Habitats moved up, habitats moved down, species existed, species don't exist, et cetera. So, uh, the NAT is is uh, very much involved in these kinds of in this kind of work. Uh oh, Mayday! There we go. Um, so another type of research that the NAT has always been involved with. This is a picture taken from 1992, and again, like we were talking about earlier. Scientists are, are by law, by regulation, I should say, um, to be on site when there's ever one of these graders out there, right? So our scientists were out there and this is the thing that boggles my mind. So they're out there, there's all this big heavy equipment and all this machinery and there's, there's lots of action going on. And what happened is they heard the telltale sign of a scraper against bone they halt the, the, the construction project. And I'm gonna flash forward just a second. This is not from 1992, but it's, it it's a really good example, pictures of, of what it is that has to happen. They come out, they dig, they encase in concrete, and um, then they take, the, uh, they take the material back to the lab. And what happens, what happens way back then what happened in 1992, which I know doesn't seem like that way, way back when, but you know, things have changed. Um, you know, they extract the bones and the fossils uh, in these jackets that are, are concrete jackets, and it's really heavy. Back then, there was kind of a tension between the folks that were doing the construction and the naturalists, the scientists that were out there. They really did not appreciate the work being halted. Flash forward, there's a lot of collaboration going on. It's a really, it's a nice sign of collaboration when think about these thousand pound jackets of encased fossils and having to move them into the truck. They literally would not help them then. They help them now. They're all they're all about it now. So it's um it's an it's an interesting change that's occurred over time. And I have to say that the museum has helped uh, educate a lot of folks about the importance of what's going on out in the field. But back to the Cerruti, the Cerruti Mastodon site for just two seconds. So you can see what happens when they find the bone, but 
um, five years ago, the research was published. They, 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 they uh, analyzed the bones, they analyzed the time, the date of the, they, uh, the carbon dating and all that. No controversy. It's where it was is not non-controversial. What it is is non-controversial. Um, what it means is a very, has become controversial. However, our scientists don't like to use that term controversy because what does a research scientist do? They analyze things. They, they have an idea. They have a theory. They publish it. It's really the start of a conversation. This started a conversation about when did human beings actually live in San Diego, essentially. So the dating of the fragments was 170,000 years ago. And what I was taught in undergrad and grad school, what you all probably know about uh, was maybe 7,000, maybe 70,000, but 170,000, that kind of blew everything out of the water. So when it was published, uh, so our scientists wanted to make sure people understood what they saw and how, it was, how the fragments were found uh, indicated to them a human settlement. There was bone chipping. Was it bone chipping? Was it not bone chipping? Meaning uh, a tool chipped it as opposed to the, the bone getting beat up on the, in the stream bed, for example. So they're, they're, they started a conversation. It's a data point. Clearly, San Diego has been so developed. How many more data points will we find? We don't know. But if you read the, if you read the, uh, the uh, some of the other data points that are being found outside of San Diego, there's a there's a tad of a correlation there. So, um, what I'd like to leave you with is just that the museum, very involved with this sort of thing. The museum is all about the conversation, and we're all kind of looking forward to seeing how many more data points we can get out of this sort of work. Um, I like to show this slide because yes, the paleontology work continues in the lab, but we have uh, a, uh, a bench that's behind glass that visitors to the museum can see as well. And um, it, it, again, it's, it, it, it gets people thinking. So another thing that we have been working on in, in the pandemic is, uh, if you remember the slide before, uh, with the earlier slides about what, what is our bioregion, and our bioregion includes Baja. Um, the Costa Cactus exhibit, which is our bioregion in space, was funded by the uh, Department of Parks, State Department of Parks. So we had as part of that a, uh, a note that said, hey, but we really want to do Baja as well. We'd like to have the Baja Hall. And that was not funded at that point. Uh, we did have some philanthropy and, uh, and fundraising and did get some of it. But we've been talking about this for literally 10 years-ish. And um, it's now coming to fruition. So this is another reason I just love this, this museum because they're, so, they're, they're just so creative. This was on the upper left side, an office space. And as you all probably have in your buildings, um, the office space was long, narrow, with doors along the way. So long and narrow. And of course, that's our, our the, the, I think that's the exhibit staff spelling out Baja. <laughs> um, long and narrow office space, which looks like long and narrow Baja Peninsula. I just think they're so creative. To, the original idea was to have it in a big cavernous typical exhibit hall, but they're repurposing this, this space to uh, literally mimic um, the space that is Baja. So you start up at the north, north entrance, like near TJ, and then all the way down to the south entrance will be Cabo. And the museum, the something I'd like to just mention here is that the museum has, well, I said something about the binational programs that we do. There is an incredible number of, of research projects uh, and collaborative 
uh, collaboration going on between Mexican scientists and, and uh, US scientists specifically um, in entomology and botany and such. So they have a lot of collaborative uh, goings on. And um, this exhibit will highlight some of the things that they've been finding. So for example, uh, there's the red-legged frog, California red-legged frog um, work that's being done essentially across the border. And um, these are the San uh, Pedro Martir mountains in the Ensenada area. And so this just is to show you, a, a give you a hint about what they're gonna be talking about, how it's going to be presented and to let you know by the researcher, Karen, the big heavy blue cooler, that this is all about, this is literally all about research. And research and conservation is the backbone of what the museum is all about. Um, this, uh, oh yes, right. So this is the kangaroo, kangaroo rat. I don't know if y'all are familiar with, uh, they thought that the kangaroo rat was uh, extinct. And through survey work and monitoring work that uh, museum uh, uh, worked on with Mexican scientists, they found the kangaroo rat. So um, there's going to be quite a bit of, of information about that. Then uh, again, down there, uh, the, the, there, are, there was some research going down at the tip of Baja and uh, they call them the sky, uh, sky islands and um, in the Isla Santa Catalina, I think they're also doing, I think it's called the Revi, Revilla Hijedos as well uh, in the, the islands off the coast. Again, survey work where they have found, they have information and data from before the, the uh, invasion, invasive species. And then once invasive species have been controlled, how the native populations are, are uh, resurging down off the coast of Baja. So that'll be something that'll be uh, part of the exhibit. Um, now, these are obviously pictures from before COVID, but I'd just like to give a shout out to the kinds of things that the Nat um, offers up to, to visitors. So we have the Nat at night. Um, there was a, let's see if I can remember the title of this, Beer, Beer and Bugs. Um, and that's Dr. Michael Wall, our, our chief entomologist and, and head of uh, the research. Um, he's showcasing his collection to some people who have a couple of brewskis in, in their hand. And, um, and so they showcase the, the, the collections, they bring in San Diego brewers, and it's a fun night. So the adults, you know, young adults can come out and learn about the natural history. We also had trivia night and that had a line going out the door. We did that, I think it was every once a month or so. And uh, literally lines of young adults coming in uh, wanting to do the trivia night. The middle slide is the, uh, the canyoneers taking folks on a hike. We had the panic room. The botanic panic. Uh, you had to solve clues to get out. Um, we also citizen science is a is a is a big deal. You know now what's really cool about apps like iNaturalist and and such is that um, it helps folks get into natural history. It helps folks identify what's in their backyard. And my personal opinion is the natural history is a a fairly um, easy way to get into science. It's, it's accessible. You identify an insect, you know what it's doing. Um, the more you learn about natural history, the more you might want to get, for example, in the gems and minerals, understand why the heck the, the rocks uh, are, when, when they're under a backlight, uh, uh, black light, what happens to them? What's going on chemically? So um, I, I really enjoy knowing that there are folks who are very interested in getting the kids engaged, getting the adults engaged. This is a slide to show that 
That's exactly what the NAT has been doing for almost 150 years. Upper left, that's from the 1920s, um, 1930s. Then the middle, upper middle is fairly recent. Now um, on the right-hand side, those are actually my feet at my house watching a NAT, a NAT talk on um, how saving the California red-legged frog. So the NAT during the pandemic was able to educate and inspire. I leave this, I leave the talk with this slide because um, I just feel it's super important to understand that the museum is a conservation organization that operates as a museum. Um, Research-based science, I, that is the engine that drives everything at the NAT. And we want the NAT, we want folks to think about the NAT as the go-to place to to the resource for what's happening in our area, credible science uh, data. And as we talked about earlier, the data points that the data points that that are that come up through the research that happens at places like the NAT, well, it obviously informs the public, but it also informs the uh, policymakers as well. So as they make decisions that impact our bioregion and the NAT wants to be, again, the, the go-to resource of this. Uh, I think the way they, they would describe themselves, the research scientists is that they are the keepers of the ecological record um, that documents our, our past, our present, and helps us, if we can, mitigate some of the things that our sheer numbers are, are, are doing to this to our ecosystem. So um, that's what I have for you all. And I'd love to open it up to uh, questions and answers if you, uh, if you the Q&A, if you, if you have any, I'd be happy to, uh, I'd be happy to chat about that. Let me